Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. When someone asks you this question, I want you to think of how you would answer it. It's a simple question. Who are you? What would you answer? You ever been at like a meeting, you know, you're all sitting around a table, or maybe some sort of icebreaker kind of event where you're supposed to go around the room and introduce yourself? Everybody's supposed to do that. We always start with our name, right? And then often we tend to follow that with something along the lines of our occupation. So let's say it's me, you know, I'm Rob, pastor at the Lutheran Church, Christ the King in Newtown. Been there for almost three years now as pastor, some months before that as vicar. And we probably go to our family life a little bit more, right? I'm married to Christy since 2002. I've stopped in public trying to calculate how many years that is. That's, that's a dangerous proposition. I can remember what year it happened. That's safer. <laughs> Father of two boys, a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. We still have birthday parties every year, so those I can remember. And then maybe I get into other interests, hobbies, background. It depends on how long, you know, how much space I'm supposed to fill, right? Who I am, who you are, really can't be answered in a single word, can it? There are a number of roles. We talked about this before. The vocations to which God has called you, that any one person could simultaneously be a sister and a daughter and a mother and an employee and a boss and a citizen and all of those various roles that we're called to fill. You're one being with a lot of different roles. That's one lens by which we can try to answer the question of who is God. It's not going to get us all the way there. I have to give you a disclaimer. We have a limited understanding. I hope I'm not the first one to tell you that because that might be, you know, sort of disappointing to hear. You have a limited understanding, particularly when it comes to God. And that may not be a bad thing. I've quoted it before, I think it's in Sunday School, not in a sermon. I've always liked the quote from Groucho Marx that I wouldn't want to be part of any club that would have someone like me as a member. Right? I wouldn't want to worship a God that someone like me could fully understand and grasp and control. Because that God, by definition, would have to be smaller than my understanding. Smaller than my power. I'm perfectly, well not perfectly okay, but I'm okay with the idea that God is bigger than my grasp bigger than my understanding. And so what we try to do is look through different lenses to get glimpses of who God is. And one lens that we can use, just like you can use for yourself, is to understand the different roles that he plays, the different things that he does. That's what we're going to do today. Trinity Sunday. We're going to talk about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, yet three persons with unique and yet overlapping roles to play. What we're going to use for our text, rather than one of the biblical texts assigned, is actually I'm going to quote for you some sections of Luther's small catechism, because I have a suspicion that for some of you it may be decades since you've read that little chestnut, and uh, there's really some good stuff, some good biblical teaching going on there, and if you didn't grow up in a Lutheran church, you may know my background enough to know that I didn't, the first time you're exposed to this can really be kind of some aha type of moments. So who is God? Well, the first thing we confess, using the Apostles' Creed, the simplest creed, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, in that small catechism, Luther writes that first, we understand that God has made me and all creatures, that he's given me, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here because Luther likes lists, he's a German, he's given me all the things that I am and all the things that I need, and he still takes care of those. So God is our maker. He's also our provider because he richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. And then he also says that God is our defender. He defends me against all danger, guards and protects me from all evil. Luther gives the reason that God does this. He says all this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. And he gives what the result of this is. He says, for all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. And as he ends each explanation of each article of the creed, this is most certainly true. Thus, God is truly your father. Now, we all on earth have different experiences of our fathers. 
Some of us look at our fathers with a tremendous amount of honor and respect and just natural admiration. Others of us, that's a lot harder. Because the fact is that all fathers, every father here, every father everywhere, is a human and therefore imperfect. And yet, when I say that God is our father, we all have an idea intrinsically, inherently, of what that ought to mean. What should it mean to be a father? What roles should a father play? I think this is wired into us because we all have a heavenly father. And what are the roles that a father does? Well, it's the same things that Luther just listed in the small catechism. Our father is certainly very involved in our making, in our creation. A father is part of why we have life in the first place. And that being done, a father's role partly includes helping to provide for the needs of his children. And a father's role also includes partly to protect and defend those children. And as a result, we have the duty, even if our fathers are imperfect, we know the command, to honor, to love and obey. To, what, how did he put it here? Where is it? Duty to thank and praise, serve and obey. So God is our Father. We confess it together. We always use the singular. It's just as true to use the plural. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. It's one role that God plays for you. And it's not really a role. It's who He is. God is your Father. Who is God? We also confess that we believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And then we follow that with a number of different historical Claims. And let me say, without exploring each one of them, this historical confession, including Christ's conception and birth and life and death and resurrection and his promise of return, most of this is way more historically certain than most other events that we consider rock-solid history. It's certainly much more historically and archaeologically attested than anything in the immediate centuries preceding or following. This has been a more scrutinized claim, a more scrutinized life than any other life in ancient history. And the evidence is overwhelming when you look at it through the eyes of faith. That's what we believe about Jesus. But who is Jesus? Again, quoting from Luther, he first talks about Jesus' two natures. We believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. We talk about his natures, and then we talk about his work, that he is our Redeemer. That Jesus Christ has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. This action too, this task, has a purpose. That I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. And it has proof. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. And this is most certainly true. Jesus truly is our Lord, which means he is truly both God and man, born here on earth to redeem us from sin's punishment. That's why I have those kiddos point at the cross every single time. Partly it's so that I always have to remember to make sure my messages are centered on that work of the cross, for truly it lies at the center of who God is and what he does. And God the Son's actions then inevitably result in and demand our own life in him, our own service to him in the new life that he's given. And the proof, the assurance, is his own resurrection and life and reign. And so it is we confess that we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And the one other very legitimate answer to the question, who is God? Well, we believe in the Holy Spirit. And once again, Luther focuses first on the work that he calls and sanctifies both me and the entire church. As Luther says, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. We talked about that a lot more last week. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. And then goes through that whole list again and applies it to the entire Christian church. 
And then, in this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. And then, on the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Notice that this is the first time that the person of God is left entirely blank. The, the first person of God is God the Father, and we're describing what does that mean to be a father. And then it's, it's God the Son, true God and true man, and we describe what does that mean. But with the Spirit, all we get is a description of what the Spirit does. And I think there's an implied message there. The Spirit is as the Spirit does, to paraphrase Forrest Gump. One of those great theologians you can read, right? The Spirit is as the Spirit does. And so we believe that the Holy Spirit does its work in us, calling us, cleansing us, and when the day comes, raising us into eternal life. And thus we confess that we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. Who is God? Well, we've just taken a glimpse, and who God is, given the fact that he's eternal and infinite, is always going to exceed our own grasp. But I've given three very good and pretty tangible answers through the creed and through Luther's explanation. Who is God? He's your creator. He's your redeemer. He's your sanctifier. Now, take a look. You may notice that we printed our own bulletins instead of using the ones that we get from Concordia. Take a look at the front. There's a reason we did that. There, visual aid, right? This is my favorite symbol. The church has a number of symbols. This is my favorite symbol for the Trinity. Because what you see with the three circles, and sometimes you'll see them overlapping, so sort of like a Venn diagram, showing that God is indeed three persons. But by intertwining it with that one triangle, it emphasizes, and yet he's still one God. It almost ends up resembling what the most ancient Greek word was for describing the Trinity. The word is translated dance. When you have multiple partners in a dance, pull one partner out and the whole thing comes to a screeching halt, and yet each partner is its own person. Each, each one involved is their own being. And so we get this dance idea here, but here's why this one's my favorite, because right at the center of that dance is what? The cross. Right at the center of who God is and how he reveals himself to you is what he did on that cross. I suppose I should, why don't we do it? Everybody, just like the kids, point to that cross right there. How's that for a visual and memory aid? Because if you want to understand who God is, we can talk about Trinity and unity all day long. Sometimes it feels like the Athanasian Creed actually does that. It's pretty long. If you want to understand who God is, look to the cross. That's why Paul said in one of his letters to the Corinthians, I resolve among you to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. Because everything that God is is centered on that act where God himself died so that we might live. And so, who is God? God is your creator. God is your redeemer. God is your sanctifier. Which means we can return to my first question. Who are you? Well, it's probably not how you're going to answer at the next cocktail party or introduction meeting that you're at. But perhaps the best, the fullest, the most joyful, and most challenging answer you could possibly give would be to say, I am my Father's beloved creation, I am the Son's precious redeemed, and I am the Spirit's reborn Holy One. Because who is God? He is your Creator, He is your Redeemer, and He is your Sanctifier. And this is most certainly true. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds firmly in this faith through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.